Chapter 22 of The Secret Play by Ralph Henry Barber. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22 Tears, Songs, and Speeches. That Tuesday afternoon practice was the hardest of the season. For four twelve minute periods, the scraps, driven to desperation by Dick's reiterated assertion, that this was the last chance to show what they could really do. Eternally prodded by Captain Nastrand and taunted until they were fighting mad by quarterback Ferrar, drove at the varsity as if their future salvation depended on the utter demolition of the adversary. Nastrand thumped them on the backs even kicked them none too gently when they crouched too high on the fence shouted threats and pleas until his voice cracked. Pete Farrar shrilly called them names. Boneheads, queers, babies, paps. And they're dumb to show one tiny scrap of intelligence of fight. And Dick, hobbling from one side to the other, scolding, instructing, praising sometimes, egged the opponents on. Even George Cutner and Pyring, took a hand in, or, rather, lent a voice to the vocal confusion. But the varsity stood firm on defense and was irresistible on attack, and the scraps, yielding gradually, were forced back and back toward their goal time and again. But how they did fight that day! One would have thought that the two teams were the bitterest enemies to have watched them mix it up. Fudge played himself out by the end of the third period and had to yield it to a substitute, as did others before time was finally called. The varsity scored twice in the second quarter, once in the third and again in the fourth, when a fumble gave them the ball on the opponent's 12 yards and Lanny, in three tries, shot across for another six points. Twice the scrub got to the varsity's five-yard line, and twice she failed to score. Field goals were barred to both teams, and it was rush, pass or nothing, and the scrubs piled themselves up against a defense that was like a concrete foundation. Later, just before the game ended, the varsity, by two well-managed forward passes, took the pig skin to the scrub's twelve yards. Less than a minute of time remained, and, after an ineffectual attack at right guard by Nelson Bitten, Hall, who had taken Chester Cottrell's place, called 39, 69, 408. Buck sped the ball to the fullback. The lines heaved and swayed. Off dashed the ends, right and left. Beaton trotted to the right, poised the ball. Right half hurled himself against an obtrusive tackle, recovered and sped toward the sideline. Then the line broke. The scraps came piling through, leaping, punting, arms upstretched. Hull went down under the onset but bitten his gaze on an upthrust hand near the goal line, dutched a scrub forward and hurled the ball straight and true above the melee. Too late, the scrub backs saw the trick. The pig's skin flew into right Anse's arms, and that youth ramped across the last white mark and sunk to his knees between the posts. Number eight had worked once more. Dick led Fudge aside later in the dressing room. I got that play, Fudge, he said. Sorry, I wasn't in when you came. What do you think of it? demanded Fudge exultantly. Isn't it a pitch, Dick? Dick smiled. I think so, he replied. I'll try it out tomorrow. It isn't a play that we could use more than once in a game, Fudge, for its merit lies in its power to surprise the other chap, and he wouldn't fall for it more than once, I guess. I don't see why, Fudge objected. 
Think a minute, answered Dick gently. The quarter kneels to hold the ball and then runs with it. The opponent might think once that it was a bona fide placement kick, Fudge, but the next time he would be on the lookout, and instead of getting sucked in, he'd watch the quarter and his backs would go through outside of tackle and smear the pass. But never mind that, it looks promising for one-time play, and, I believe, it's going to be just what we will want on Saturday. I only wish you'd thought of it before, Fudge. So do I, but, say, I've got another one. Save it for next season, laughed Dick. There's no time to teach more plays now. What's the matter with your ear? Some idiot kicked it, I guess. Fudge felt of it cautiously and winced. Better bathe it. It's pretty well swollen. Well, thanks for the play, Fudge. There was a mass meeting in assembly hall that evening, and the fellows sang and cheered enthusiastically until at nine Lanny and Dick appeared and mounted the platform. Lanny spoke first. He had the simple, direct way of talking that pleased his hearers, and tonight, although he said nothing very new, he managed to work the meeting into a fine frenzy. Cheers followed, repeated over and over, and then Dick arose and faced a new tumult. He couldn't help but contrast this greeting with that which had met him at that former meeting and the thought brought a smile to his face. When the cheers had subsided, he spoke. Fellows, there isn't much anyone can say on the eve of a big game, and anyhow, Captain White has got ahead of me. I do want to thank you personally, though, just as White thanked you on behalf of the team, for the splendid support you have given us all season. A few chuckles were heard. I want to thank you too for your, for the good feeling you've shown me. I appreciate it. And I want to tell you that it has made a difference, helped more than you can possibly realize. I don't want you seem to be asking for credit for whatever share I've had in the development of the team. But I do want to say to you that when I undertook this job, I didn't appreciate what it meant. It's been, well, it's been hard work, fellows. Harder work than I expected. And there have been lots of discouraging moments. And that's why I say that you've helped me, just as you've helped us all, by letting me know, as you have let me know, that you had confidence in me in spite of my, my limitations. Now, fellows, your part, your share in this isn't done yet. It won't be done until the final horn squawks Saturday afternoon. You can do a lot from now on, quite as much as you've done already. I want you not only to believe thoroughly that we're going to win, but I want you to make the team understand that you believe it. I want you... I ask you particularly to make Springdale know that you believe it. There's a lot of talk nowadays about psychology, whatever that is, and some of it's probably poppycock. But I firmly believe that there's such a thing as so impressing the adversary with your confidence that he will be affected by it. It isn't just a theory, either. I've seen it work out more than once. I suppose you'd like me to tell you what I really think about our chances to win on Saturday. Well, I'm going to tell you even at the risk of making the team overconfident, which is something it can't afford to be. I think we're going to win, and win decisively. Dick had to wait for the applause to subside then. I don't mean by that that we'll pile up a big score. For I think the teams will be too evenly matched to score many times. But I do mean that when the battle is over, there won't be any doubt as to which is the better team. 
I'm not belittling the enemy. Springdale has a fine team. A team at least 25% better than she had last year. You have only to study the results of the games she has played this season to realize that. But on the other hand, we've got a fine team too. Along more cheering than wild and continued. Along in the middle of the season, I told you that our team was no more than an averagely good one. I think it wasn't. Then, now it is. It's as good a team as ever represented the school, and that's saying not little when you recall some of the teams, which, although not very lately, have defeated Springdale by overwhelming scores. But good as it is, it's got to play hard, play for all it's worth, play like, like thunder. The Springdale line is a strong one. Few teams have made much impression on it this fall. The Springdale backs are a fast and clever lot and have scoring power. The team has been finely coached and knows a lot of football. They have good punters over there too. No better than ours, I think, but not to be despised. There's one thing they haven't got, fellows, and that's a man to kick field goals. Cheers and shouts of Brand, Brand, A.A., Brand, broke into the discourse, and Morris, sitting in the front row, studied his scarred hands attentively and hid the look in his eyes. I want to prophesy, fellows, continued Dick, that if we get the ball inside the Springdale 15-yard line, we'll score. I'm not saying how we'll score, he added with a smile when he could go on, but we'll score. Cheers and laughter mingled, and someone increased the ladder by shouting, Every little three spat counts, old man. I guess that's all I have to say, ended Dick. You've got the team. All you've got to do is to be back of it every minute and let the other fellows see that you're back of it. Don't get the glooms if they score first. Keep on cheering. The game isn't over till it's won. The meeting gave itself over to riot for several minutes. Then the singing began again, and finally, hoarse, jubilant, excited, the fellows made their way out of the hall and down the stairs to form in a procession outside the building, and marched, cheering and singing through the quiet streets of Clearfield, acquainting the sleeping inhabitants with the fact that the team was all right, that Captain White was all right that Coach Lovering was equally all right, and that so play as you may, you can play better than he with a CHS on his sweater. On Thursday, there was no scrimmage, but instead a hard two hours of drill. Fudge's play was tried, but since all proceedings were behind closed gates, we are not presumed to know how that child of his fertile brain turned out. Still, merely judging by Fudge's pleased and important expression during the next day or two. It is allowable to suppose that the play proved satisfactory. On Friday, the school marched in a body to the field with banners flying and purple megaphones beating time to the strains of Clearfield's Day, performed by Dell Silver Cornet Band, 11 Strong, and sung by some hundred and fifty voices. There was no scrimmage, but the two varsity squads trotted up and down in signal work and kicked a few goals, or tried to. For some reason, Morris Brent wasn't given an opportunity to prove his ability, and the spectators stood up in the stand and cheered and sang at the behest of a boy with a yard-long megaphone, and enthusiasm was rampant. And at the end of 20 minutes or so, the scrap team, who had finally daffed their uniforms the day before, gathered together in front of the stand and cheered the varsity, and the varsity squads joined forces nearby and heartily cheered the scraps, 
and all preliminaries were at last over and the stage was set for the performance. End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 of The Secret Play by Ralph Henry Barber This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 23 Cable Kicks Off There was a final gathering of the council at Dick's that evening. What time the school was conducting its last football mass meeting in Assembly Hall. Lanny, Cutrell, Katner and Tapper attended. And Dick, of course. Tapper had been asked to come, since Dick wanted to go over carefully the plays that were to be used in the morrow's game, and it had been decided that in case Lanny was forced to leave the team, George Tapper should act as captain. They were all rather serious tonight. Lanny especially showed the strain. Dick felt it, but did not show it. On the five, Chester Cottrell alone seemed fairly in his usual condition of mind. Together they went through the game from start to finish, providing as well as they might for every contingency. Plays were prescribed for this situation and that, and Chester was put through an examination in the choice of them that would have staggered a less confident youth. One or two doubtful plays which had been placed in the repertory were now stricken out, for somehow this evening their judgment seemed to have found a new clarity. Sometime I think I've got too many plays, observed Dick doubtfully, but we don't have to use them, I suppose. The only objection to having a lot is that the fellows are liable to get them mixed, said Lanny. Still, if we drop three and eleven, that leaves us only eight freaks. I don't like that word freak, said Dick, with a smile. I hope they won't prove freaks. Don't you worry, Dick, replied Chester heartily. The place we've got are all right, and you'll find that they'll keep Springdale guessing too. The only one I'm scared of is that number ten, the one Fudge calls his... Secret play. How the dickens did he happen to think that up? Asked Tapper. I don't know how he thought of it, replied Chester. But I don't believe it will work, fellows. It isn't expected to work more than once, answered Dick. And then, as you understand, Chester, only under certain conditions that may not happen. I've mulled it over a lot and I realize that it's risky. But if we pull it off, or try to, we'll be where it's going to be necessary to take a risk. And, after all, fellows, more games are lost by avoiding risks than by taking them. If it comes to that, said Lanny, we won't have anything to lose by that play if it goes wrong. It's to be used on third down, you know? Sure, but wouldn't another play be more certain? Asked Chester. A forward pass? Inquired Lanny. Not necessarily. That direct pass to full back for an end run, for instance. That's a hard play to size up because it's hidden until the runner gets started. I like that play and I think it's going to work any number of times. But the secret play, as you call it, I don't call it that. I call it number 10, remonstrated Dick. Well, whatever you call it, I don't see what's to keep Springdale from cheering through on it and smothering it way behind our line. Well, you saw how it went yesterday, said Lanny. I didn't see it tried out before an opponent, answered Chester dryly. There was a silence for a moment. Then... Well, if you fellows think it isn't going to make good, cut it, said Dick. I may be all wrong about it, and, as Chester says, we didn't have a chance to try it in a scrimmage. Mind you, said Chester, I haven't got cold feet on it. That is, I'll try it, all right, 
and make it go if it can be done. Only thing I say is that I don't see how it's going to fool the other fellow. As Dick says, observed Lanny, it's a risk, but we've got to take risks tomorrow. I say, use it. All right, that's good enough for me, agreed Chester cheerfully. If it does go, it'll go hard. I'll say that for it. After the others had gone, bidding him good night, rather soberly on the porch, Dick took himself to bed. But sleep didn't come readily tonight. There was too much to think of. He wondered over and over if he had done wisely here or well there, wondered for the hundredth time if his plans, his methods, his strategies were to be crowned with success. He wondered whether the team was really as good as it had seemed to him yesterday, even this afternoon. There were moments as, tossing back and forth on his pillow, he heard eleven and twelve o'clock strike, when it seemed to him that nothing but certain defeat impended, that there was not the smallest chance in the world for a clear field victory. That wasn't a pleasant vigil that Dick kept up there under the roof that night. Some time after twelve he fell asleep, but only to turn and mutter for a long while after his tired mind evolved dream after dream, in all of which misfortune pursued him relentlessly. When he awoke, the world was gray and cold, with a foretaste of snow in the air and he found nothing in the outlook to inspirit him. But a cold bath set sluggish blood to tingling again, and a cup of steaming hot coffee brought back courage and determination. While he was looking through the papers, the telephone bell rang, and he found manager Katner on the line, irritated of voice. Springdale had just telephoned over for thirty-five more seats, and they didn't have that many unless they could get the workmen out there to put up some temporary ones. The matter was really outside Dick's jurisdiction, but George was so perplexed that Dick gave his mind to the problem for a moment. There wouldn't be time before 2.15 to get seats up, George. He answered after an instant's reflection. Call up, Mr. Grayson and see if he will let you have half a dozen rows of chairs from Assembly Hall. I think he will if you tell him your fix. You can put them along the front of the Springdale section. That was but the beginning of the telephone's activity. Chester called up next, and after him George Katner again. George was now in a condition of sputtering wrath. The Springdale manager had just telephoned that Watson, the man who was to have umpired the game, couldn't officiate, owning to illness, and could Clearfield find someone to take his place. Springdale would be satisfied with anyone selected. Get right after Mr. Cochran, George. Try the YMCA first. If he's not there, run around to his house on D Street, the White House near the corner of Lafayette, I think he will do it. How about the seats? They're all right. I'm trying to get hold of Stuart now. Sorry to bother you so much, Dick. Goodbye. After that until late afternoon, Dick had no chance to be gloomy. He was much too busy. The team and substitutes gathered at 12 o'clock in the mansion, the smaller and quieter of Clearfield's two hotels, and had their luncheon. Dick presided and did his best to keep the fellows steady. On the whole, there was little indication of nervousness, and the meal passed off quite cheerily. At one, they adjourned to the upstairs parlor, where, behind closed doors, Dick put them through a final examination in sickness. By that time, the town showed the presence of the invader. Blue bonners and armed bands and megaphones were in evidence on the streets, and the cars coming up Pine Street from the station were well filled. Manager Katner joined the team, 
breathless and tired, just before they were ready to start for the field. I've just had an awful experience, he gasped as he sunk into a chair. Mr. Grayson telephoned to me for an extra pair of tickets and wanted to pay for them. What are we coming to? Did you let him? laughed Bert Cable. No, but the experience quite unnerved me. Cochran's going to umpire for us, fellows. The Springdale chaps got tonsillitis, or laryngitis, or bronchitis, or... or... called fetitis, suggested Lanny. Cochran's all right, I guess. What's the time, Dick? Time to go. Are the cars pretty full, George? Jammed. Looks as if all Springdale was here. They're running extras through from the station, though, and I guess we can crowd on. Already? Come on, then. Gee, but I wish this was over. By a quarter past two, when Springdale came on for practice, the stands were nearly filled. The blue had a section to herself, and it was a blossom with waving flags and small white lettered megaphones. Dal's silver cornet band augmented for the occasion to the grand total of fourteen pieces, discoursed sweet, well, discoursed music. Let us not be too particular as to the quality of it. Springdale was well represented. Clearfield was there in force. Dick had given tickets to Louise Brent and Mrs. Brent as well, as to his sister and mother and they were seated together in the front of the stand, Louise armed with a silken purple flag. Five minutes after the blue team appeared, Clearfield's warriors emerged from the dressing room, and Lanny Lilly trotted out to warm up. Mr. Newman, the blue's coach, crossed the great iron and shook hands with Dick, and the two talked for a minute. Then Mr. Cochran appeared, and presently the referee, Mr. Lathrop, joined the group. At each end of the field, balls were arching over and under the cross bars. Nelson Bitten and George Tapper trying their kicking fit for Clearfield, and Saddle and Norton for Springdale. Morris Brent, although he had trotted about for a minute with the first squad, had returned to the bench. At two minutes before the half hour, the teams returned to the sidelines, and Mr. Lathrop walked into the center of the gridiron with Lanny, while from across the field came Captain Turry of Springdale. The two leaders shook hands with each other, and Turry with the referee. Then a silver coin gleamed for a moment in the sunlight, which, since noon, had been shining half-heartedly through the sullen clouds. Three heads went over as it fell. Turi's hand waved toward the east goal, and the little group broke up. All right, fellows, called Lanny cheerfully as he came back to the bench. We kick off from the west goal, on the run now. Blankets and sweaters were dropped, and eleven purple stacking youths raced out to spread themselves across the field. Springdale arranged herself for the kick. A last cheer came from the stand and silence fell. Already, Captain Turi, called the referee. Already, Captain White. The whistle sounded. Bert Cable, who had teed the ball to his liking, stepped forward and swung his foot, and the game was on. End of chapter 23「Chapter 24 of The Secret Play」by Ralph Henry Barber. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 24 Between the Halves Clear Field Merrick Left End Patrick Left Tackle Cable Left Guard Haley Center A Bitten Right Guard Wayland Right Tackle Felker Right End Cottrell Quarterback White, left half back. Tapper, right half back. And Bitten, full back. Springdale. 
Cummings, right end. Terry, right tackle. Furnish, right guard. Heath, center. Cannell, left guard. Gray, left tackle. Borden, left end. Kelly, quarterback. Sotel, right halfback. Cook, left halfback. Norton, fullback. That was the way the teams lined up at the start, with no surprises on either side, unless possibly the absence of Brent at fullback could be considered such. But it had been Clearfield's policy all the fall to put Brent in only when a field goal was called for, and the fact that he did not start the game aroused no suspicion. Morris blanked wrapped sat beside Dick on the Clearfield bench and watched moodily as Sotel cocked the kickoff some dozen yards in front of his goal and sprung forward with the ball. Murray tried for him and missed and it was Wayland who finally locked his arms about the runner and downed him on the 20-yard line. Clearfield applauded the tackle and the teams faced each other. Springdale used a formation in which the ends dropped back a little, and the backs made an oblique tandem behind right or left guard, a shift which placed a guard on both guard and tackle on the opposite side of the line, was generally used, and sometimes the backs formed behind the long side, and sometimes behind the short side a future which caused not a little perplexity to Clearfield during the first of the game. A split attack, the first man in the tandem going to the right, the second man straight ahead, followed by the quarter carrying the ball, and the third man to the left was a favorite play and fooled the opponent many times. Springdale stuck to attacks between tackles all during the first period punting when unable to gain by rushing. Her line was heavy and fast, played low and hard, and usually managed to open holes. The backs started from close behind and stacked the line almost as soon as the ball was put in play. Springdale's policy was to get the jump on her adversary, and it must be acknowledged that she succeeded. The oblique tandem leaped into place just before the ball was snapped, and often the play came through while Clearfield was still moving to meet it. From the 20 yards to the 40, Springdale worked her way without pause, the backs making short but consistent gains between Patrick and Wayland, and finding the right side of the Clearfield line the easier proposition. Arthur Bitten was put out of the play time and again, and Dick sent Kent in for him at the end of some five or six minutes. Springdale's supporters were cheering incessantly as the Blue plowed her way toward the middle of the field. Kent bore a message to Cottrell and cleared field, who had been playing six men in the line, now dropped her other end back. This allowed both halfbacks to close in toward the middle, and the next two tries at the center failed. Still disdaining end runs, Springdale sent Norton back to kicking position, and knifed her left half between guard and tackle on the left. But the fake had not deceived the adversary, and Cook was stepped for a slight gain by Tapper. Springdale then punted from the 48 yards, and the ball went out at Clearfield's 23. It was the Purple's chance to applaud, and a hearty cheer went up as the ball was brought in and the teams lined up again. Formation B evidently inspired the opponent with misgiving, for she dropped her backs into a deep basket formation, leaving five men in the line and spreading them well open. Cottrell tried out the other team's defense, with a straight plunge at center, which went through nicely and followed it by a run-off tackle on the left, that added three yards. 
With two to go, Lani piled through right guard for first down. Springdale brought her back further in. Being convinced that Clearfield's strange arrangement of her backfield did not necessarily foretell a forward pass, and two tries left netted the purple but four yards. Faking a plunge at the center, Cottrell sent Tapper tearing off to the right, but the interference failed and he was stepped near the sideline for no gain. Lanny punted to Springdale's 40 and Felker down the cutter in his tracks. Springdale, her quarter running off his place like lightning, came steadily back. Kent was proving hardly stronger than Arthur Beaton, and many plays went through his position to be stepped by the secondary defense. Lanny played a magnificent defensive game sensing the point of attack and jumping to meet it. More than once, he was literally awaiting the runner when the latter shot through. Springdale was showing a powerful offense, and her linemen were playing like veterans, which, with three exceptions, they were not. Buck passed the center of the field. The blue progressed, using old-fashioned football all the time, but using it so well that the brunt of the defense was falling to the lot of the clear field backs. Springdale got her place off so quickly and from so close to the line that it was difficult for Clearfield to foretell the point of attack. A penalty for holding set her back but failed to stop her. On Clearfield's 42, with four to go on third down, Kelly, the Blues quarter, again tried the fake kick, and this time Clearfield failed to size up the play. Kelly himself plunged through cable and eluded Lanny for 12 yards, and the blue flags waved riotously in the stand. The pig skin was now almost on Clearfield's 30. The blues fullback hit the line for three yards and tried again for no gain. The split attack went past Haley for three more and on the 25-yard line. Kelly again sent Norton back. This time the play was a double pass and Sotel got through between Kent and Whalen. The defense having been badly fooled, the tape was used and first down was declared. Before the ball could be put in play again, the quarter ended. The teams traversed the field and lined up again on the 20 yards. Clearfield now played her ends in and spread her backs. Kelly failed to gain at the right, and Sotel made three through the opposite side. Clearfield supporters were imploring the purple to hold. Springdale sent Norton back and rushed two backs and an end to a left as the ball was snapped. Norton swung his leg, sidestepped and hurled across to the group, but the throw was short and Falker knocked it down. Again Norton went back, but the ball was passed to Cook, and that youth went dodging and spinning through the center. But he was stepped on the 15 yards, and the ball went to the defenders. Two plunges gained four yards, and Lanny kicked from almost under the goal. The ball went low and rolled erratically, finally being dropped on by Kelly close to the tee in midfield. Springdale accepted the challenge and punted on second down after a two-yard gain. Cottrell cocked in his 24 yards and dodged back seven before he was thrown. From kick formation, Lanny took the ball around Springdale's right end for five yards. A forward pass was then attempted, Cottrell to Merrick, but Springdale had guessed the play and Merrick failed to make the catch. Lanny punted to the Blues 27, and Cook brought it back five. Springdale now started at the ends, and her first attempt sent Sotel around Merrick for 12. A fumble was recovered with a loss of four yards. Norton tried cable, but was thrown back and Cook failed to get through Wayland. 
Norton punted to the Purple's 26, and Lanny fumbled but recovered on the 20-yard line. Dick sent Hansard in for Tapper, who was limping badly. Hansard bore instructions to Cottrell to get his plays off faster, and an improvement in the speed of the team at once resulted. The teams were well over on the left of the grid iron, and Cottrell pulled off the number six play with success. This play brought Merrick running obliquely back from position before the ball went into play. Hansard going into the line between guard and tackle on the other side to maintain the required number there. Beaton played back in kicking position. The ball went to Cottrell, however, and he made a two-handed pass to Merrick as the latter swung by between him and Beaton, and, with Lenny interfering, raced in a wide arc around his own right wing. Springdale was cocked napping and Gordon covered 18 yards before he was stepped. Enthusiasm took possession of the Clearfield supporters, and purple megaphones howled and shrieked. Springdale was for a moment off her balance. It seemed for skin tackle play on the left, with Lanny hugging the pig skin, went for seven yards. Cottrell speeded up the team, and in two plays the ball passed the middle of the field. With three to go on third down, Hansard keeping his feet wonderfully, fought straight through for six. Springdale tightened then, and Lanny was thrown for no gain when he tried left of the opponent's line. Beaton fell back to kicking position, and hurled the ball across the line to Falker. The latter got it, but fumbled when tackled, and the ball popped into the arms of a Springdale back, who was downed on his 34. The rest of the period was Springdale's, for she came back hard and for a time almost drove Clearfield off her feet. Wayland was hurt and gave way to Scat, and Springdale replaced her right guard and her left tackle. But there was no time to score by the methods Springdale used. Only twice were runs outside of tackle resorted to the blue apparently striving to wear down the purple's defense by furious assaults. Once Cook nearly got away, but was pulled down from behind by Lanny after he had made almost 15 yards through the right of the Clearfield's line. On the purple's 28th, Springdale made a forward pass to the side of the field, and again for a breathtaking moment, it seemed that the blue was about to score, but Cottrell forced the runner over the line at the 20 yards, and before Springdale could gain farther, the whistle blew, bringing the half to an end. The Clearfield players trotted to the dressing room, and the visitors retired to a tent in a corner of the field. Cheers and songs started again. The band played its loudest, and some 1,200 spectators excitedly discussed what had happened and predicted what was going to happen. There was no gain saying the fact that the Blue had shown the more consistent offense, or that in the matter of punting, she had fully equaled the home team. That Clearfield plainly possessed a more versatile attack was a lot but whether she had plays capable of gaining inside the 20-yard line was a question, except that, as everyone knew, Brent could be depended on to score from the field provided the line held. Doubtless Clearfield would do her utmost in the next half to reach a position where Brent's science could be used. As to defense, it seemed a toss-up between the purple and the blue. Both teams had been well trained in that department. If there was any difference, it lay in the fact that Springdale's forwards were a bit quicker at charging, thus leaving less work to the backs. In the two periods played, Springdale had made eight first downs to Clearfield's three. Not an encouraging showing for the home team. 
perhaps Dick was considering that as he followed the team and substitutes into the dressing room, at least he looked sober enough in all truth. Springdale was not showing the signs of overtraining that Dick had more or less counted on. Although there had been moments in the last few minutes of the second period when he had thought he could detect a falling off in the power of the attack. The removal of two linemen also suggested that the blue was approaching its limit of endurance. For his own team, Vic had no fears. They had stood the hard smashing of the Springdale backs excellently. Not a player had weakened under the strain, and none of those taken out had sustained injuries sufficient to prevent his reinstatement. Dick expected the Purple to play better in the next two periods. Expected it, in fact, to finish stronger than it had begun, for there was no denying that it had played a slower and more listless game than it had showed against Western the week before. While the fellows were being wrapped and having their bruises attended to, Dick conferred with Lanny and Chester Cottrell. Lanny was pretty well keyed up, Chester unusually grim and silent. We've got to have Tapper back, Dick, declared the captain. Hanser doesn't get into it. All right, Lanny, and look here, you've got to hump that line up on defense. Do you get me? They're getting the jump on us every time. What's the trouble? I don't know, replied Lanny rather wildly. They've been letting every blessed play through on us. That's a mean attack of theirs, Dick. You can't size it up. I know, but you've got to watch the ball, Lanny. You can't tell where the play's coming by guessing. Another thing, fellows. It won't do to spread your backs too much near goal. Better play your ends well out and force the runner in, and keep your backs behind center. They haven't any running game that we need fear, I think. Of course, they'll try to spring something this half, and we'll have to be on the watch for it. But whatever you do, Lanny, and you, Chester, don't let them score on a line play. They can't if you charge quickly and watch the ball. And, Chester, you're not getting your place all fast enough. I want you to see things go twice as fast this half. It's their kickoff this time. Let's see if we can take that ball straight down the field, fellows. I'll tell you frankly that you haven't been putting up half the game you did against Weston or Lesterville. You've got to wake up and fight. That's what you've got to do. And well enough satisfied with what's happened so far. We've let them work themselves pretty tired, I guess, and we've held them off. But for the rest of the game, we've got to jump and smear them. We've got to force the fighting, fellows. Line up quickly. Get your signals off quickly, and then... Dick smote a fist into the other hand. Smush into him! The others nodded, Lanny eagerly, Chester thoughtfully. And use your delayed place more, Chester. Try the number eight, and if it goes, keep on using it. And once near their goal hammer the left side of their line. That new tackle of theirs doesn't look much to me. Stick bitten through there a few times. Find the weak spot and hammer it flat. But above all, play fast. You've got to do it. Dick turned on his heel and sought Tapper. How's that knee, George? He asked. All right, Dick. To prove it, Tapper arose eagerly from the bench and swung his leg. Dick smiled. All right, go in again, but take care of it. And George, we've got to play faster than we've been playing. See if you can get more jump into it. Merrick and Falker, here, please. For several minutes, Dick spoke earnestly and in low tones to the two ants. Then Manager Katner who had been keeping track of the time, announced that only four minutes remained. And Dick swung himself over to the window and faced the room. The noise died away. I'm not going to tell you fellows that you've played good football, because you haven't. 
began Dick earnestly. You've let Springdale get the jump on you all through the half. You haven't watched the ball as you should, and you've been fooled time after time for that reason alone. You're every bit as good as Springdale, but you don't let them know it. You linemen have let play after play go through you, just because you've been watching your opponents instead of the ball. You'll never win that way, fellows. You're putting too much work on the backs. They can't do it all. You've got to keep your eyes on the ball and charge quick and hard. Some of you have been playing much too high. Get down low, and when you charge, lift them up. Remember that you're facing men several pounds heavier than you are. The only way to even that up is to play faster than they do. Don't meet them on your side of the line. Meet them on theirs. The same thing is true of you backs. You've started slow almost every time. And you've let up when you hit the line. Don't do it. Get your speed before you strike the line and then keep on going. I ought not to have to tell you these things at this late day. You know them well enough but you don't do them, or you haven't done them. You've got to for the rest of the game, though, if you want to win. Someone's going to score this half. It might as well be us. But if it is to be us, we've got to play better football. We've got to watch the ball, play like lightning, and fight like bear cats. Springdale is going to tire before long, but she's got a lot of fight in her yet and you've got to work hard to keep her from winning. I want you fellows to go back there now and start in and everlastingly play football. Wake up and show something. You've got it, fellows, so show it. When you get the ball and the kick off, hang on to it and take it right down the field and put it over. You can do it if you only think so. That's all. Play hard, Clearfield, and fast, fast. Fast! And now then, Merrick, Patridge, Cable, Haley, A. Bitten, Scott, Felker, Cottrell, White, Tapper, and N. Bitten. All right! On the run, fellows! cried Lanny. The door slammed open, and out they trailed. The team to throw off their blankets and race into the field, and the substitutes to huddle again along the bench and watch and wait. Cheers met them, and the band started. See, the conquering hero comes, much of the tune, perhaps, but enthusiastically enough to make up for lack of harmony. Clearfield spread itself about the east end of the field, and Springdale lined up behind its forty yards while Heath, the center, built up the tee and cocked the ball to his liking. The sun had gone behind the clouds again and a little cold breeze was quartering the field from the northwest, causing spectators to pull racks around their knees and button coats at the necks, and the players to tread about as they waited for the whistle. Ready, Captain Turry. Ready, sir. Ready, Captain White. All ready, sir. The whistle blew. Heath strode forward and swung a long leg and the pig skin arched into air again. End of chapter 24。Chapter 25 of The Secret Play by Ralph Henry Barber。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Chapter 25 The Secret Play Tapper cocked near the side of the field and allowed himself to be forced over at the twenty-yard line. The ball was taken in, and Chester Cottrell slapped his hands and barked out his signal. White back! Forty-seven! Sixty-eight! Sixty-two! Lanny fell back to kicking position, Nelson Bitten taking his place behind left guard, and Chester jumped aside to the right. Forty-seven, sixty-eight, sixty-two. Buck shot the ball to Chester. Off darted Tapper for the guard tackle hole in the right. Bitten and Lanny swung wide to the left. For a moment, the lines heaved and fought. Then the ball clutched to his stomach. Chester plunged straight ahead, 
and went through where Haley and Arthur Bitten had opened a wide hall. The Springdale line had been pulled apart and the secondary defense had been drawn out. Chester slipped away from a tackle and staggered on, dodged past the back, and was pulled down finally after ten yards had passed under his feet. The linesman pulled up the ruts and scampered past two white marks, and the clear field section shouted wildly. Chester, breathless, was pulled to his feet and trotted back to position. Regular formation, he called. Line up. Get down there, Scad. Signals. 309, 25, 62. Lanny jumped to the right in front of Chester. 309, 25, 62. It was Lanny's wall direct from center, and he sprung at the same hole as before, Tapper clearing it out for him, but only two yards resulted this time. Second down, eight to go announced the referee. Line up quickly, called Chester. Here we go now, regular formation, signals. 98, 99, 84, 98, 99. The ball went to Chester, was passed to Nelson Bitten, and that youth struck like a cannonball at the opposing left guard and tackle hole and piled through for four yards. Clearfield was getting the jump on her opponent at last. Get up, get up, shrieked Chester impatiently. Signals! The ball was on Springdale's 36 yards now. It was third down and four to go. Lanny pulled Chester's head down and whispered. Signals! repeated the latter. 22, 53, 306! 22, 53! Tapper had slipped into the line between right guard and tackle, and now Gordon Merrick was running back toward where Nelson Bitten crouched behind Chester. Then came the ball to the ladder, off raced Lanny behind his line toward the right. Chester passed to Gordon, and that player, one hand outstretched to ward off attack, and the ball in the crook of his right elbow followed Lanny. The spring lail tackle was boxed and Felker sent a half buck flying out of the path. Then the cry of In, In was heard and Garton, passing behind his interference, sped through an opening in the enemy's front and was laid low for a seven yard gain. The middle of the field was in sight now, and thus far every play had told. A plunge at the clear field right. Bitten carrying the ball, game three. Lanny shot outside of left end for four more. Bitten made two at center. And Chester knifed himself through for first down on Springdale's 46 yards. The Clearfield supporters were cheering incessantly, and the bass drum was thump, thumping loudly. Springdale was fighting desperately, but the pace was beginning to tell on her. Time was called for an injury to a Springdale tackle, and when, finally, he was on his feet again, an eager-faced youth was reporting to the referee. Holman, sir, left tackle! The injured player yielded his head guard and limped off, and the new arrival gathered the team about him, and for a moment or two there was a whispered conference, interrupted by the referee. Then the punting players faced each other again. The backs crouched behind Cutrell and he piped his signals. Bitten slammed into the line at left guard and got through for nearly three yards. But Scat had been detected offside and Clearfield was set back five yards. With 15 to gain, Lanny tried his own left hand but failed to get past. Bitten hit the center for two on a delayed pass. Lanny got three through left guard. Bitten went back to kicking position, and Partridge crossed to the right of the line. Cutrell and Tapper moved to protect the panther. Then the ball was snapped to Bitten, who swung his foot, ran half a dozen paces to the right, and poised the ball. Cutrell and Tapper guarded his front for a moment, and then the latter swung wide to the right toward the sideline, 
and Lanny cut through outside tackle and went down the field. Merrick and Falker had also sought positions for the pass, but Falker was guarded. Bitten waited until the last moment, and then, just as the Springdale players leaped upon him, stepped back a pace and hurled to Lanny, who was for the moment unguarded. The throw went over the center of the line, just escaped the upstretched hands of the leaping blues, and was cocked by Lanny nearly twenty yards away. Like a flash, he wheeled and set off down the field. But the Springdale quarter was not to be the night, and Lanny was pulled down by the Blues' 26 yards. Cheers and shrieks of delight came from the stand. Dick nodded to Morris, and that youth arose and walked up and down the sideline, his gaze fixed anxiously on the champs. But time had been called for Lanny, who had had his breath pretty well knocked out of him in the tackle and Dick turned tentatively toward McCoy sat further along the bench, blanket wrapped, his eyes too bent intently on the field. But Lanny was soon up again, and, had you been sitting next to McCoy, you'd have heard a sigh of disappointment. Chester Cottrell thumped the lineman on the back, hoarsely encouraging and threatening. Lanny pulled his head guard on again, and the whistle shrilled. The backs sprung to their places, and Cutrell gave the signal. Tapper received the ball and hurled himself at the right of the line. But the blue held, and there was no gain. Cutrell scolded it and raged. A crisscross sent Lanny three yards through left guard, and it was third down with seven to go, the pig skin of the twenty-three. On the sideline, Morris was trotting slowly up and down, casting eager, inquiring glances at Dick's inscrutable face. Signals! shrieked Cottrell. Get into it now, Clearfield! Make this go! Signals! 81, 29, 61! Watch for a forward! called the Springdale quarter from under his goal. Come back, Holman! Break this up, Springdale! 81, 29, 61. The ball went to Chester. Lanny and Tapper swept to the right and hurled themselves a tackle. Chester, his back to the enemy, hugged the ball. Confusion reigned. The left of the Springdale line broke. Then Bitten sprang ahead, took the ball at a hand pass, and slid through the center, was tackled, plunged on, fighting and squirming went down with two Springdale backs on him and finally grunted, Down! The whistle blew and the referee sprang at the pile up and healed up the spat. Fourth down, he called. Two to go! On the sideline, Morris tacked his sweater and cast an impatient look at Dick. But the latter shook his head and Morris walked back to the bench and sat down again. They've got two yards to go, Dick he said doubtfully. Yes, and they can do it, Morris. Your time will come. Wait. And do it, they did, Lanny himself squeezing through between center and left guard for just enough to secure first down. The ball was now on the 13 yards, and Clearfield was yelling like so many Comanche Indians, while steady cheers for Springdale rolled across the field. Cottrell hurried the fellows back into place, called his signal, and hurled Bitten at left tackle. Two yards resulted. Springdale was stiffening now under the shadow of her goal. Bitten was yanked to his feet and hobbled back to position. 98, 49, 32, the line set and the backs crouched. 98, 49, 32, back came the ball. Lanny and Tapper plunged at the left of the line. Bitten sprung forward and... Ball! Ball! cried Chester. Bitten had fumbled. Springdale lineman hurled himself past with a mighty rasping of canvas and plunged forward. Chester was tossed aside. A muffled voice called, Down! and the whistle blew. Springdale's ball! cried the referee.
First down, ten to go. A groan of disappointment rose from the clear field stand. But the blue pennants waved mightily, and two hundred Springdale voices burst into wild acclaim. Bitten with miserable face, hung his head as the blues quarter took command. But Lanny shouted encouragement. Never mind that, fellows. Let's get it back. Now play, play. Springdale hurled her fullback through for a scant three, made to more around the left end, and then punted from under her goal. Her line held fast, and the ball went flying up the field to Cottrell, who made a fair catch on the 38 yards. Then the journey back began. Lanny got through the left for four yards, and Bitten was stepped for no gain. Then the quarter came to an end. Dick sent Kent in for Arthur Bitten, Todd for Partridge, and Toll for Falker. A minute later, the teams lined up once more on the Blues' 34 yards. On the next play, Springdale was cocked offside, and Clearfield gained five yards. Lanny tried a wide run around left end and made a scant three yards. With three to go on fourth down, Lanny punted. The ball went over the line and was brought back to the 20. Springdale made first down in three plays through Cable. The latter was hurt and Roby went in for him. A forward pass following an unsuccessful try at center gained six and Sotel added two past Scott. Norton went back, but the ball was passed to left halfback and that player got around Merrick for four, securing first down on his own 43 yards. Springdale pulled her line apart and scattered her backs to the right of center across the field. Clearfield shifted to meet the formation. The ball went to left half on a long pass from center, and he raced around the short side of his line. But he only made three on the play. A fake kick resulted in a try at the forward, but Merrick broke it up, and, with seven to go on fourth down, Springdale punted to the Purple's 24. Lanny caught and got Buck eight yards before he was stepped. Cutrell again tried a delayed pass, but the enemy got through and downed Bitten for a loss of two yards. A crisscross made five through right tackle. On the next play, Cutrell took the ball for a try around right end, but was pulled down behind his line, and it was fourth down with nine to go. Cutrell was plainly used up, and Dick sent in Hull. Chester received a fine ovation as he came off. Hull, after a conference with Lanny, sent Bitten back and the ball went to Tapper, who squirmed through outside left tackle and evading tacklers, managed to make it first down near the sideline. Hall displayed a lot of ginger, and the plays began to go off faster, with Lanny back in kicking position. A straight plunge by Bidden took the ball to the middle of the field. Lanny secured the needed two yards past left tackle. Hall failed at a run around his own right wing, and on the next play, get off a fine lateral pass to Merrick, who made eight yards before he was thrown. Bitten plugged the center for four and a first down. A fumble was recovered by Benton for a loss of six yards, but to offset that Springdale was detected holding in the line and the ball went back again. A forward pass from the late play, Bitten to Tapper, almost got the youth free for a touchdown. But the Springdale quarter stepped him on the Blues 27. Three tries gained but four yards, and Bitten hurled to Merrick. But the throw was short, and the Springdale end got the ball and ran it back to the 36. Springdale failed to gain in two attempts and punted to Lanny. After romping halfway across the field, he was pulled down for no gain. Lanny tried the left end and made two. Bitten failed to get through right guard, and Lanny punted to Springdale's 33 yards. 
Springdale put in three new linesmen in a substitute fullback. McCoy went in for Tapper. There was six minutes to play now. Springdale was no longer able to gain through the line and tried wide formation attacks, with the runner handing a hole wherever he could find it. She gained on two such plays and made first down on a forward pass. She was showing the strain now, and her forwards were weakening. Another attempt at the forward pass from her 45-yard line failed, and she punted to the purple's 30. Hall cocked and squirmed and dutched back through half the opposing team, being finally halted on his 48 yards. Time was now nearly up. Dick sent in Brian for Merrick and Brimmer for Haley. Haley had been pretty badly used and was distantly groggy as he was led off. Brian brought instructions and the purple players gathered in a group and listened to them. The linesman announced four minutes to play as the teams faced each other once more. Hall sent McCoy at the center and gained four, sent the same player against the right of the line and made two. Then Lanny sped past left tackle and barely gained first down on the opponent's 42 yards. Beaton fought through center for three. Then with Beaton back, number eight was tried again and Toll cocked the pass for a 12-yard gain and almost get free for a run. Clearfield supporters were on their feet now, imploring a touchdown, and Springdale was cheering steadily, doggedly. Springdale put in a fresh center and a new left half, and Dick substituted Arthur Bent for Kent. With the big skin just back on the Blues' 28 yards, Near the right side line, Hall sent McCoy around the long field end for a scant gain of two yards. Then Bitten made four between left guard and center. A delayed pass with Lanny carrying added three. With Lanny back in kicking position, Hall himself took the big skin past right tackle and for two made it first down on Springdale 17. On the bench, Dick nodded to Morris. Beaton tried left of the Blues line and secured a scant yard. Springdale called time and administered to her right guard. Lanny attempted to get past left tackle, but was pushed back. Springdale again asked for time, and as the whistle blew, a southern cheer burst from the Clearfield section. On to the field raced two purple stacking warriors. One was Chester Cottrell and the other Maurice Brett. Springdale, in imagination, saw the game slip from them then. It would be no trick for Brett to drop or place kick from the 17 yards. All right, Perry, called Chester. Sorry, let's have that head guard. The players clustered around Maurice and thumped him ecstatically. Perry Hall trotted disconsolately off, and the whistle blew again. Clearfield sprang back to position, Bitten following Hall from the field, and dragging his feet wearily as he went, effort jumbled in articulate prayer for victory. All right now, Clearfield, shouted Chester cheerily. Here's where we score, everyone into this heart. On the bench, Fod Shaw, taking the place beside Dick, left vacant by Morris, whispered nervously, Is he going to try it now, Dick? Dick, his hands clutching his crutches tensely, his face rather white and strained, nodded without turning. Fudge gave vent to a huge sigh. Gee, he muttered fervently, I hope it g goes. Then Cottrell's voice came sharply across the field again. Brent back! Left tackle over! Morris slowly retreated to kicking distance. Black this! shouted Springdale. Black this kick! Get through and block it! Chester followed Morris back and knelt in front of him. All right? he asked, looking up. Morris nodded, shuffling on his feet. Chester patted the ground with his hand. 
Morris looked for an instant at the crossbar and edged back another foot or so. A little more this way, he said. Block this, Springdale, implored the blues quarter, dodging back and forth behind the line. All right, said Morris. Quiet fell over the field. The clearfield lineman crouched, Lanny behind his own left guard, poised tensely. Across from him, Tapper stood ready to guard the kicker. Tad was between Bitten and Wayland on the right of the line. Chester facing the left, one knee on the ground, held his hands toward the center. Signals, he shouted briskly. 44, 18, 110. Morris gave a final look at the crossbar. The enemy, panting, gasping, swayed restively. 44, 18, 110. Block it, block it, shrieked the defenders. Buck sped the ball to Chester's outstretched hands. The lines heaved. Canvas rasped against canvas. Bodies strained. Cries and grunts from labored lungs made pandemonium for a moment. Morris stepped and swung his leg. Half a dozen blue-clad arms reached in air. The Springdale right end broke through. Buck met Lanny and went hurtling aside toward the line. And then... Just as the Springdale forwards came charging through, Chester, the ball snaggled in the crook of his left elbow, sprang up and darted straight ahead toward the left of the field. Ahead of him ran Lanny, but Lanny had little to do. Springdale was tricked. There had been not the slightest doubt in the mind of any of them, but that Brent's appearance at that moment meant a try for a goal. The line from end to end had been intent upon but one thing, and that was to break through at any cost and block the kick. Strengthening the right of the clear field line had drawn an extra Springdale back to that side, and now Chester was in a slight danger of being stepped. Lanny threw himself in front of the Springdale quarter and sent that frantic youth rolling head over heels, and Chester striking in toward the goal line, crossed it without opposition. It was not until he was almost behind the nearer post that hostile arms dragged him to earth, and he was smoothered by angry blues stacking defenders. Cheers thundered from the stand. The bass drum thumped a pean of victory. Caps and megaphones sailed into the air. And on the bench, a round-faced youth sat silent in wondering and awed delight. The secret play had won. Two minutes later, Nelson Bitten, racing back to the field, kicked the goal that added another point to that glorious six. And 40 seconds after that, the final whistle trilled and George Katner, snatching the ball from the umpire, raced into the throng with it, dodging the ecstatic youths who, flowing onto the field, were capturing the players and racing them shoulder high, while the band played unheard and a bubble of voices proclaimed Clearfield's victory. Ten minutes later, still, when Tabby Sears was standing perilously on the railing of the grandstand leading the cheers, a hoarse voice demanded, Lovering! We want Coach Lovering! The demand was multiplied by 200 voices and willing emissaries darted away in search of him. But they didn't find him. Dick, a contented smile on his face, was blocks away, chugging home in Eli. End of The Secret Play by Ralph Henry Barber